Good morning. If you have your Bibles, I desire you to open them up to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. This morning we will likely conclude this series. But as we go through and we look and we recap, I'm going to re reference probably the majority of these here at different times today in different ways. Uh, but what we're going to be looking at is the first one. Um, and as we look at it, we're likely going to go in a slightly different direction. Uh, but if you allow me to read this to you real quick, uh, we'll just we'll just dive right in and uh, um, let's go ahead first. Exodus chapter number twenty. And I'll begin reading in verse number 2. And the Bible says there in Exodus 20, verse 2, it says, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you again here this day, Father, again, Lord, we're thankful, Father, to be in your house. Father, we're thankful for many blessings, God, that you've given us. Father, we're just uh, thankful, Lord, that you are who you are. Father, we're thankful, Lord, for everything it is that you've done for us. Father, even though we don't deserve them, Father, we're thankful for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, we just ask you that you'd meet here with us this day. Uh, Father, the Lord, that you would just uh, show us and reveal to us, Father, all the little gods, Father, that we have in our life. Lord, the little things that we serve, the little things that we put in front of you. Uh, Father, the things that we don't even realize that that is what we're doing. But, Father, we just, uh, uh, we, we just pray that you would just uh, be with us. Lord, help us to grow. Uh, Father, just help us to be with you. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would be with me here this morning. Uh, Father, that you would just allow me to speak only the things, God, that you desire. Lord, that you would just uh, uh, to help your message to be what comes out. Father, not anything that I think or anything that I desire to say, but Father, we just pray that each and everything that's said and done will be according to your will, Father, and be pleasing unto you. Father, I ask you, Lord, that you be with the congregation, Lord, again, just to uh, bind the powers of Satan here this morning, Lord, just help us clear our minds, Father, to focus upon you, Father, to allow us, Lord, just to uh, not, not just hear your word, Lord, and not just to read it this morning, Father, but to uh, allow it to sink in, Father, into our hearts, Lord, that it may uh, uh, just uh, uh, spring uh, uh, forth new life life spiritually, Father, within us, Father, that we may be able just to, uh, to truly be able to uh, uh, please you in all manners of, of what we do here this day. God, we ask these things in your Son, Christ Jesus' name. Amen. In Moses' word and what God has given him here in the Ten Commandments is what we know it as. Uh, God starts this in a manner of telling us who he is and a why. He says, I am the Lord thy God. He didn't say, I want to be. He did not say that I desire to be. He simply put it out in exactly the way it is as he's uh, given this to tell to Moses. He said, I am the Lord thy God. He is saying, I am yours. That is important for you and I to know because long before God saved us, he already had the desire to be our God. He had a desire for us to be able to serve him. He starts that off, I am the Lord thy God. So he starts the sentence, he starts the story that way. There's really no room for debate. There's no room for, uh, there, there's no margin for error within that. I am the Lord thy God. And then he follows that up in the manner that I am the Lord thy God. And he follows it up with what he has done for them. He follows it up in a manner of which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. As we uh, look this morning in Sunday school, the things we just kind of uh, starting that story. You're just starting to see some of the oppression that the uh, Egyptians began to put on the children of Israel. But we could very easily say that today in today's time in a New Testament application, we could say, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought you out of the bondage of sin. I am the Lord thy God that has delivered you from yourselves. I am the Lord thy God that has granted thee grace and mercy. We could say whatever we want to say, but it's going to start with I am the Lord thy God. 
I am the Lord thy God which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. God is saying because of what I have done for you, I am worthy. We, he deserves our praise. He deserves our thanks. He deserves our worship. He deserves all the things that uh, uh, we couldn't possibly give him. But he is well deserving of that in looking at what he has done and delivered and brought forth to his people from the very beginning generations all the way through until today. I am the Lord thy God. But he's saying because of these things that I have done, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And those are little g-gods. As we've talked and went through these, we've, uh, we've identified a lot of other gods that we can have. We've identified, we've looked at covetous. Uh, you get into Colossians, I believe you find it in the third chapter, you'll find that covetous is idolatry. Things that we truly covet becomes idols. If they are idols, they are things that are coming before God. Whether we want to argue the fact that they are coming before Him or coming after Him, either way, it becomes idols that begin to, uh, we devote our time and our attention unto. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Let me flip over here and read you another spot or so. Just a few pages on over. You get into Deuteronomy. I'm going to read you just a little bit here. In chapter number 13, Deuteronomy chapter number 13, I begin reading in verse number 1. It says, If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. And the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love him, whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Pause. What's being brought before the, 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 the children at this point is the fact that God is not denying that there may be other... Well, you, we get into New Testament places. You can find even in the Old Testament, you can look at uh, uh, things of the false teachers and of Antichrist and uh, uh, people who can... Uh, 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 sorcerers, wizards, whatever you want to throw out there. God is cautioning you and I not to be dismayed and not to fall into that, uh, uh, that, that pit, if you will. Uh, God is desiring you and I to stay the course and to stay focused upon Him. He said, even though there may be some people that could tell you whatever it is that you might want to hear, and it just might so happen to come to pass, you are not to follow after them. He is desiring us to say them, but get into that, uh, that, that uh, second half, if you will, of verse number three. God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God. Notice the words that are used. To know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul. It gets back into being of a personal manner. Come back up top. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. What would make things come before God? We can have class participation. You're allowed to speak at this point. What would make you have something come before him? It would be a strong like or desire or interest in whatever that might be. We might could say it's because you love something. Do you know why most Children get put before God, it's because the parents truly love them. Do you know why many spouses get put before God? It's because the, uh, the other one truly loves them. There is a deep-rooted, uh, uh, strong connection and bond and love that is there. 
And I think at this point we can identify the problem while we constantly have other gods that come before our God, the one true God, the living God, the God who has said that he is a jealous God, the God who has said he is a God of mercy and a God of truth and a God of wrath, the, the God who has said that, that I am, I, that I am. God desires to know whether we love him with all of our heart and with all of our soul. And then it comes down in verse number four and it says, ye shall. The words, the tone, even the descriptors that is here, we can look and we can see thou shalt not. That means there's no debate. We're not going to do that. So when you find the opposite thereof saying, ye shall, this is a, a, then becomes a must. It's not anything that's optional. It's not negotiable. It is what it is. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and ye shall serve him and cleave to him. Be close to him. Cling. Um, we get other gods that come before our God because we find ourselves with love for something other than God. I want to flip over to John. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about all the little g gods that we can find in our life because I feel over the last few weeks we have identified them in many different ways. We could talk about the causes or we could talk about you know what they may be. That's the way I need to say that. We could talk about what uh, uh, the gods may be, uh, but I feel we would be better suited at finding the cause. Jesus says in the chapter number 14 of the book of John, he simply states, if you love me, keep my commandments. Plainly stated, if you love me, keep my commandments. We can identify each and every single one of these ten. When we break them, it's because the love of God isn't as prominent in our lives as it needs to be. We don't have that uh, deep-rooted, intimate connection that God desires you and I to have. As He has named Himself, I am the Lord thy God. He desires to know whether or not we love our God. He is identifying Himself as ours, whether we identify Him as ours or not. Do you catch what God is doing? God is claiming you and I. How many of us claim him? We just refer him to as uh, 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 Jesus Christ, the Savior. Do we uh, refer to him as God Almighty? There is a huge difference in saying it is Jesus Christ, my Savior, and my God Almighty. There is a huge difference in us claiming him and us simply referencing him. But in every way that we have looked at this morning, God is already laying claim to you and I. And he is stating that as being he is our God. To even the lost people out here, God is still their God. He is still the God Almighty. They may not know him. But the Bible also says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Does it not? He is their God. Jesus states, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you skip down about six verses, you'll find again, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father. 
and I will love him and I will manifest myself to him. When you look at manifest, it's um, make myself known to him, if you will. Make myself uh, 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 visible. It might be another word that you could say. Make myself uh, 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 more clear. However it is you need to say that, but when we love him, when we have that love that is there, when we can get rid of all the rest of this, we can get rid of all the other gods. And friend, we can, we can have a ton of gods in our life. Each person that come in a church house this day, this morning, uh, right here, uh, first Sunday in September, every person that come in, there is a good chance you brought another god with you in some way, shape, form, or fashion, because there are many things that comes before God, whether it be the, uh, uh, harboring uh, 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 ill will, hate, d disgust for, uh, for people, that in, in and of itself can become our God, uh, whether it be our, uh, uh, our, our just the, the vanity of ourselves and the pride in which we have, uh, uh, pride in our, in, in our looks, in our clothes, in our jewelry, that can become our God. These can be things that uh, uh, take precedent that we're not coming into the church house uh, to, to worship, we're not coming in to praise, uh, but we're coming in to put on our fashion show to show this is what we God, or uh, maybe we just drive into the parking lot to uh, uh, show off our new vehicle or that we actually washed it, whatever it may be. There are many, many, many churches that are filled with gods other than ours. And it's simply because the love isn't there. Look at the three Hebrew children. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We've not been forced or we've not been faced with death if we worship in America. We've not. Anybody in here been told that if you worship God, you're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace? No. We've not. But these gentlemen was, and they didn't care. Daniel was simply told, hey, if you continue to pray to your God, we're going to throw you in the den with the lions. And they're going to be hungry, and you're going to be fresh meat, and they're going to eat you. That's what he was told, but he didn't care. He continued to pray anyway. He continued to put his God first because the love of God was there. How many of you present have faced some type of persecution. Two? Okay, good. Two of us. It's not bad out of a crowd of 30. Two out of 30 ain't bad, is it? Honestly, how many people here has faced some type of persecution because you're a Christian? Most of us ought to be able to raise our hand to some extent. What does that cause us to do? It causes a, a bag of mixed emotions inside, doesn't it? We're not sure of really, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible tells us to glory in those, in those times and to uh, be, be thankful that somebody saw enough Christ in us to even be mad at us or to hate us for, uh, for associating with Christ. The Bible tells us to do that, but the flesh tells us that this ain't good. We don't want this. We don't want to feel that way. Uh, we don't want to be treated in such manners. And oftentimes we will take just a few steps back to try to blend back into the middle somewhere. And we take those steps back because the love isn't there either. Jesus simply stated, if you love me, keep my commandments. Look at the things that Christ told us. He taught us that if we were ashamed of him, he would be ashamed of us. Not only would he be ashamed of us before his father, he'd be ashamed of us before the angels. He'd be ashamed of us. And we, being Christian people, and us being church-going people, we are not going to say that we are ever ashamed. We're not going to say that because we don't want to say that. We have been taught not to say that. But what we do is we just simply don't speak at all. 
We won't proclaim this or that. And we, we just really want to just to stay right here in the middle. We don't want to stick out in the front and we don't want to stick out in the back. We just want to blend in so we can get through this thing called life so we can make it to this place called glory. We just simply want to just roll with it, don't we? And we want to do that because the love of God isn't there. Men, how many of you had the opportunity to step out on your wife? Women, how many of you have had the opportunity to step out on your husband? Why didn't you? Because you loved him. You didn't because it would destroy that relationship that would be there. You didn't because you had love care and affection and an intimate relationship with your spouse. That's why you didn't. Do you know why we have all the little G gods in front of our God? Because that love isn't there. It has nothing to do. We can say it's a flesh problem. We can call it a sin problem. We can say that we was born this way. Yes, we was. We was all born sinners. Guarantee it. It takes the same amount of grace to save you and I that's been raised in church as it takes to, uh, to save the most wicked, vile person you could ever imagine. The same blood was shed on the same cross of Calvary and it takes the exact same amount of grace. And the same love that we have that keeps us at home with a spouse is only a fraction of the love that it, we need to keep us at home with our God. If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus goes on to say in verse number 23, the 14th chapter of the book of John, he says, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come into him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, Keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. It's not a matter of choice. God gives us the free will choice in life. I have the choice to make, do right, and I have the choice to do wrong. You're right. It's temptation's fault. Temptation comes, and I yield to that. Well... It came to Jesus also, and he simply said, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and, and him only shalt thou serve. It was still a matter that Jesus didn't yield to those things because he loved his Father. We can blame it on whatever we want to blame it on, but it simply stated, it, it is simply put, we either do these things because we love God, or we don't do them because the love isn't there. Not very popular this morning, am I? Not very easy on the ears this morning, is it? But it's a truth and it's something that every single Christian, every deacon, every deacon's wife, every preacher, every preacher's wife, every Sunday school teacher, every, every pew dweller, it's something that every single one of us deals with. It's whether or not we love God. You, 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 uh, you answered the call to do what God would have you to do because you love him. Not because of anything else. Not because, well, you know, that's just what my family does. They would be upset if I didn't. Uh, uh, you know, the church is counting on me to do this. I have to. None of, none of that garbage matters. You answer the call because you love God. You know, as Jesus was praying in agony in the garden, and as his sweat became as great, as, as great drops of blood, as these things was going on, uh, he, he was in the flesh. He knew what he was going to face. He knew what pain was. He knew what hunger was. He was every much as human as you and I. But it was love that took him there, and it was love that kept him there. That's the love that is given to you and I. What is the reciprocation of that? What are we giving back? 
most of the time, I won't even say most. I'll say even if we phrase it as some of the time, that's still not acceptable. But some of the time, it's minimal effort. The least we can get by with. Go back through each one of these. It has to do with the love of God. We love God and we're content with what we have. Godliness with contentment is great gain. That's why we're not going to spend all of our time coveting. Thou shalt not bear false witness against our neighbors. You know why we're not going to do that? Because each one of our neighbors was made in the likeness and in the image of God. And if we love God, we're going to love our neighbors. Thou shalt not steal. We're not going to go steal it because we love God and we trust that he is going to provide all the things that we need. Thou shalt not kill. We're not going to do that either because we love God and we understand that vengeance is his. Honor thy father and mother. Well, God is your heavenly father. If we're not going to honor our father and mother on earth, we're probably not going to honor him. It's all coming back down to love. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You know, if we truly love God, we ain't got to worry about coming to church and making our presence known because we're not coming here to satisfy the congregation. We're not coming here to make the numbers go up and we ain't coming here to help the offering. We are coming to this place because we love God. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. If we truly love him, that's not even going to be an option either. Thou shalt not make into thee any graven images, and thou shalt have no other gods before me. These things are all obsolete if, we, if our heart is right and in the right condition to love God. All of this boils down to love. Jesus speaks in the latter part of John 13. And as he is talking about the importance of his people, he is talking about the importance of Christianity as a whole, and he is talking about how we are to be known by others. It is also by the same word, love. He says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. How are we to love one another? He even answers that too, as I have loved you. But you also love one another. You look at the ways in which Jesus loved his disciples. He washed the feet of the one that would betray him. Of all the things that he could have done to defend himself when the, uh, when the band of soldiers came to arrest him, he just simply came up and said, here I am. I'm the one you're looking for. He loved them enough that he went to the cross. He loved them enough that he, uh, he, he left his home in glory and he lived with them. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Not that you are some disciples, not that you could be disciples, but he even again takes ownership in this and he's laying claim to you and I. By this shall all people know that you are mine if you have love one to another. Any problems that arise in church, you know what the bottom line comes down to? Love. Problems that arise in your life, uh, your, your spiritual life, your relationship, fellowship between you and God. The bottom line is it's not a sin problem, it's a love problem. We either love the sin or we love God. The Bible tells us that we can't serve uh, two masters. You'll uh, love the one or hate the other. We can't, uh, we can't live, uh, you know, I, I, I really like these things. I want to hang on to this lifestyle. I want to stay in this manner. If we love God, it's not going to be a problem to walk away from it. We stay in the area because that's what we love. We all say that home is where the heart is, right? Where's your heart? 
we look at our home. I'm not talking about here, that our temporary place. I'm not talking about your address. I'm not talking about wherever it is that you find comfort. I'm now talking about our eternal home. A place that you and I have never seen. We've not, got on, we've not been able to get on Zillow and look at any of the real estate photos of this place because we've not seen that. We can't even fathom what this is going to be. But our heart should be longing to go there. As the day of the Lord quickly approaches, the love should be growing more and more because it's not going to be that much longer until we get to see the Jesus that saved us, till we get to see our Savior, till we get to see the one who has delivered us from uh, all, the, uh, all the sickness, all the could have beens, all, uh, uh, all the possibilities, all the scenarios that we could ever imagine. We get to see the one who led the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt till we get to see the one took the nails let me ask you this about four years ago I preached a series about sins against the spirit it was uh, uh, I'm not going to go back to a name but it was about quenching the spirit vexation of the spirit just different things you, you may or may not remember them if you do that's great if not I, we, we, we preached that we talked about it Let's say Jesus comes through the back doors right now. A physical form of your Savior turns the knob and he enters into Oakdale. Are we going to casually stand up and Jesus? Are we going to hurt one another to be able to get to him? to worship him first. Are we going to say, well, let's let the kids go first. Let's let them go see him first. Hey, let's let some of the older ones get up there. Let's, uh, it, it, it may take them a few minutes. Hey, uh, we know, anybody here that's like really sick or got some uh, uh, ailments going, hey, let's let them go so they can get some healing. Uh, or, or is that really what we're going to do? Spiritually speaking, what is inside of you is going to be busting to get to him to reunite with the one that knows one another. When Jesus comes in on the clouds of glory and he calls us home, we're not just going to nonchalantly walk up and say, well, hi. That's not how it's going to happen and that's not how we should treat him here. We do the best we can to keep all these uh, feelings and emotions buried to the point that nobody even really knows if anybody's Christians anyways. We sat in churches all across the land with zero love and zero emotion. And it's not a climate of the church problem. It's not the way the preacher preaches problem. It is simply a heart condition and our love problem. And it's personal. The entire congregation of Oakdale can't love God the way we need to until every member loves God the way they need to. How long before we can reach our potential? We've talked about this so many times of all the things that we would love to see Oakdale be able to grow and to do and to be able to, uh, uh, be able to reach and to help all sorts of people in different kinds of ways. And everybody would love to sit here and say, oh, I would love for Oakdale to do this. And I would love for Oakdale to do that. I, I would love to see the, uh, the, the church as a whole, not just this church, but even our, our, our whole area, the Monroe area. None of those things are going to happen until we can develop a love for God. We have love for other things that we won't, we won't give up. Don't we? We can all nod our heads, we do. Fred, the doctor put you on a strict diet last little bit. Is there some things that you just really don't want to give up? And you're going to keep having them, ain't you?
there are things that we're going to cling to. Over the last month, this doctor that Billy Lewis had me, or the diet that Billy Lewis had me on, I mean, I'd give up things that I never dreamed that I would turn loose of. She ain't took my whole milk from me yet, and that's where I draw my line. I'm going to have my milk. Mindy brought me a Gatorade yesterday while I was out digging a ditch, and she didn't bring me one of the zero sugar kind, and I turned that thing up and I chugged it, and I felt like I was high for a minute. I was as jittery as I could be. I ain't had sugar, and I can tell you when. Things that I never, I've had a, a, an elaborate love affair with Little Debbie my whole life. Might near kicked her clean out of my house. I'm telling you, there's things that we never thought we would give up, but when you get in a spot to where you really figure out what's important. When we get to the spot that we figure out that, you know what, everything here that I see and that I cling to is temporary. Nothing here will last. Only what's in here is going to last. That's when we begin. That's when we can be able to make and to see the difference. It's when we figure out, I'm going to love God. I'm going to turn loose of this, and I'm going to love Him. There is no way that I can love Him the way that He loves me, but man, I'm going to try every day. I'm going to give it all I've got. I'm going to try to love God with all my mind and all my heart and all my soul. I ask you if you'll stand together with me this morning as we get ready to close. My desire today and through these last few weeks has not been to point fingers at anybody or any particular thing. This series has been a reflection of things that I deal with on a daily basis. I can honestly say that preaching these 10 things that are listed behind me, I have preached more to me than anyone else at any given time. Especially today. We can all say that we have things that we enjoy and things that we love and things that we, we want. But until we can truly say that we love God and mean that, until our congregation hits the point to where we can say that we love God above all things else, we love God, church, we can't grow. We can't prosper and we can't move forward until that love for God is there. We can all say, I love my kids. We can all say, I love my wife. We can say that I love this and I love that. But until we can truly say, I love God and mean it, we've hit the ceiling and we can't go any higher. It's a heart condition, church, that we got to fix. I can't fix it for you. Your spouse can't fix it for you. Your kids can't fix it for you. It's something that only you can do. We've closed this way many times before, but I'll ask you in way of invitation to choose you this day whom you'll serve. I ask you to love God, not because he commands it, not because he has said it, but because there are lost and dying people that depend upon your love for God. I ask you this morning if you need to pray for you to come.